Welcome. We have a remarkable program for you today. The Department of Defense must interact with civil aviation, and we have some remarkable stories to tell about air defense in identification zones and TFRs. Our presenter today, Major Ty Piercefield, is, among other things, a Delta Airlines pilot. He's a major pilot in the Air Force, and he's also a hurricane hunter during the hurricane season. Today, he'll be talking about how you can understand how the air defense zones work, how TFRs work, what to do when it won't happen to you, but jets are scrambled for some other pilot. And you can bring that story to your friends. Please welcome Major Ty Piercefield. Thank you, Kathy. All right, thanks. Hi, thanks for coming out today. Um, my name is Major Ty Piercefield. I'm going to be giving a little talk today on behalf of AFNORTH and the military. Just a quick background brief about myself. Um, I grew up just down the road here in Tampa, Florida. Fell in love with aviation when I was growing up, decided I need to be a pilot. Graduated from the Air Force Academy and learned how to fly while I was there in the late 80s. I was active duty Air Force for nine years. I flew T-37s as an instructor, uh, C-130s and airlift, and then search and rescue C-130s before I got out. I got over in the traditional reserve slot of the Air Force Reserve, where I'm still flying Hurricane Hunters, a WC version of the 130. Um, I got hired at Delta Airlines in 2000, so I've flown a little bit of all of it, whether it's civilian aviation, military, or commercial airlines. Um, right now, I'm working on behalf of uh, uh, Major General um, Well, see, we just got a new general come in. Major General Morrow, that's what it is. And uh, on behalf of AFNORTH, First Air Force, that's in, up in Tyndall Air Force Base in Florida. What I'm going to talk to you today is I work in the Combat Plans Division of the Air Operations Center at Tyndall. Um, we have a multifaceted mission where we are uh, integrating with the FAA and doing a multi-layer defense, um, discussing uh, exactly what NORTHCOM does and how it affects general aviation pilots in specific. This is what I'm going to talk about today. The NORAD mission, um, air defense identification zone operations, a little bit about, because that's kind of specific to Florida aviation, general aviation in specifics. Temporary flight restrictions, uh, what to do if those procedures get violated, what the uh, military, you might expect for intercept procedures, what we kind of do from a, a fighter air defense pr perspective. And then finally, a little bit on disaster relief and operations that we might do uh, as a part of a joint ops area or in conjunction with FEMA for a natural disaster type scenario. Uh, a little bit about the command and control. Uh, CONER or Continental US NORAD region is the vision of NORAD. NORAD, most everybody's familiar with, it started in the late 40s um, as a joint venture between uh, the US and Canada in the Cold War era talking about external threats. Um, Specifically, the Kona region, which is the continental U.S. region, is split up currently into two sectors. We have the Western Air Defense sec Sector out of McCord Air Force Base and the Eastern Air Defense Sector out of Rome, New York. Uh, the AFNORTH AOC, which is where I work, is at Tyndall Air Force Base, and it runs a kind of a conjunction and integrates the two sectors. Uh, the NORAD region itself is uh, the headquarters of NORAD and NORTHCOM now. We're up at Cheyenne Mountain. Kona is the continental U.S. region. It's integrated in with Canar, and the Alaska region is specifically dealing with uh, Alaska. Uh, the NORAD agreement and how NORAD interacts with NORTHCOM. The primary mission of NORAD is airspace warning and airspace control. We're really talking about airspace sovereignty of the United States when you're talking about the DOD portion of North American air defense. We want to be able to take the appropriate actions, identify all the aircraft flying in the continental U.S., and uh, be able to protect the, the airspace around North America. Obviously, this is a continuously evolving threat. Um, before 9-11, we, 
we were concentrating on external threats, um, a strategic type mission looking at the, the former Soviet republics and being attacked from outside our borders. We learned from September 11th in a very sharp way that the, today's threat's a little bit different. It's complex, it's less deterrable. You've got more fanatical type of uh, um, people that are trying to attack us. And that's, this is what we have to try to posture to defend against. Pre-9-11, like I said, here's what the NORAD or the Conor posture was. Our sensors and our fighters all were looking outward. We were looking out on the US against airborne threats, and we were not monitoring any inter interior threats. There was no um, intel that we had immediate threats against the CONUS. Airline hijackings are specifically in the uh, domain of the FAA. And DOD assistance was only going to come in for an internal type of event like the September 11th scenario with, through coordination from the FAA and with the Secretary of Defense approval. Everybody, especially involved in aviation, knows exactly where they were on the morning of September 11th. This is where the, the CONUS alert posture was as far as for North American air defense. You had seven alert sites with combat um, ready aircraft. Uh, 14, you know, two aircraft at each of those alert sites. And again, the posture is looking outwards. Um, if any of you have seen the September 11th movies that have come out, United 93, that type of uh, scenarios, you know there was a lot of coordination, communication problems going on between the civilian agencies, the FAA, and the military that didn't help in the, in the reaction time to it. However, 18 hours later after the attacks, we had stood up uh, pretty significantly, you know, between aircraft on the land, aircraft on, in the sea, in the Navy base, all the Coast Guard assets, and we had obviously you know, the most significant alert posture we've had, making sure that it wasn't a wave type of attack thing coming at us. Our current posture, we have, uh, we don't talk in specifics obviously about it for security reasons, but we do have multiple alert aircraft at multiple alert sites as well as a um, overlapping number of tankers which will provide air, airborne refueling for the fighters once they're airborne in case they need to respond to an alert staying up there a little bit longer. Uh, with not just the fighter aircraft and tankers, but the sensors, the joint surveillance system that is now integrated in is much more robust than it was before. Um, a couple of the mechanical parts that go into the joint surveillance system. The air route surveillance radars, anybody that's done any flying around, you notice the uh, golf ball looking things, either right around the airports or at air traffic control centers around the US. These are uh, the latest generation of the ARSR4 rate radars. They have a search range of about 250 miles. They're capable of, uh, of pinging the aircraft for all the different mode codes, whether you're talking about your mode 3, your mode C, which is your altitude encoding, or the classified codes of, of just military aircraft, the mode 4s. Um, along with that, you have an airborne, a tethered aerostat radar system. Uh, anybody that does a lot of flying down in the Florida Keys is probably familiar with uh, what's been affectionately nicknamed Fat Albert. That's one of these tethered aircraft balloons. They go up to 15,000 feet. Uh, search range is comparable to the ground-based systems, 200 miles. And this gives you a look-down capability, which, especially when you're talking about the air sovereignty of the US, we're, we're very concerned about. They're mostly along the coastlines. Uh, there will be a restricted airspace bubble around them. They're, they're tethered aircraft. These are not free flying. So you've got a, a cable winch system that can take them up and down, whether for maintenance or whether they're up there. And you definitely don't want to be flying into one of those with a civilian type aircraft. Um, who runs these? These uh, um, tethered aircraft balloons started out in the 1980s, mostly operated by the Customs and Border Patrol. They were used for anti-drug surveillance for the drug smugglers that used to come in. Uh, in much greater numbers from South and Central America. Now it's a kind of a combination. Since post-September 11th, the DOD has a tasking ability on that too, to be able to tap into those radars on the tethered balloon. So it's kind of a shared responsibility between the Customs Border Patrol and the DOD. Um, improving this command and control, we integrate these systems in. And as you can see, they're mostly on the perimeter prior to September 11th. This is what we were looking at external. Since September 11th, we've added this many internal radars into the DOD system. What this means is that those air defense sectors, whether you're talking about McCord up in Washington uh, for the Western Air Defense Sector or the Eastern Air Defense sec Sector out of Rome, New York, they are able to 
integrate in all the local approach control radars, all the center air traffic control radars, and get an actual picture of every aircraft that's flying in our airspace. So we have a much more robust and uh, um, all-encompassing radar system. There's not very many dead spots at all where you could have a plane airborne and have uh, the FAA and the military together not know that you're up there. How about the uh, air-to-ground and ground-to-air communications? Um, again, what we could tap into before was external. We've added all the internal sites in there. And we also have the ability for a contingency operation, like we saw during Katrina, where you have mass power outages over a wide geographical area, where we can go add temporary sites. Um, these can be on the back of a truck, uh, big mobile radar communication SATCOM systems, or there's uh, some future communication capabilities coming on where you have much more portable, kind of man-sized, you can hike it in in a rucksack and actually have SATCOM and these C2 communications going. So for contingency operation, you're going to be able to you know, talk with the aircraft that are up there with responding aircraft and have a much more uh, broad-based ability to communicate. OK, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the air defense uh, identification zone and the temporary flight restrictions. I put this slide in here as just kind of a historical backup to show you that I, we think the word's getting out, that we're getting a lot better, uh, general aviation pilots in specific, about understanding the flight restrictions that have been imposed by the FAA post-September 11th and is uh, generally reducing the need for us to actually scramble fighters to identify aircraft. For this period of two years ago, September 04 to 05, the entire continental United States, we had 640 tracks as a, a for example. This includes any unknowns for coming in over the coastal ADA zones, um, TFR violators that get your attention really quick, um, any FAA requests for assistance or, or suspect tracks that we're going to actually tap into the military system and have NORAD, NORTHCOM, and the, and the AFNORTH forces identify and be interested in a specific, we call it a target of interest, um, resulted in 377 scrambles. Enormous amount of money when you talk about actually getting down, it's getting through our layer defense where you're concerned enough about an aircraft to launch an alert fighter to go out and ID or check out an aircraft. So that was 04 to 05. 05 to 06 dropped down to 392 tracks, only 37 scrambles. So Word's getting out, we're getting a little bit better at, uh, or general aviation, the pilots out there are getting better at following the procedures and doing what they're supposed to so that we don't have to spend that type of money. Um, now zeroing in a little bit more on this local area since we're in Lakeland, Florida, try to tailor it for the local area. In the southeast USA in the last year, of those 392 unknown tracks, that accounts for 61% of them down here. Now why is that? Uh, we have more TFRs, you got a lot of special events that have occurred down here, the Super Bowl down in Miami, and like we'll show here in a second, the beh whole Bahamian corridor is responsible for much of these because we have so much light traffic going back and forth to the Bahamas. Um, of the unknown tracks that were identified on the southeast, the Bahamian corridor from 05 to 06 was responsible for 41% of those, so we're talking about uh, either flying IFR or VFR flight plans for the short distances to and from the Bahamas. This is where the procedures probably need a little bit more emphasis so that we can cut down on the number of scrambles and intercepts that we have done on those aircraft. Uh, $114,000, that's just an average for what it, a cost dollar figure when you're talking about scrambling F-16, F-15 in their flight hours. So that's, of course, on top of all the um, layered costs that it occurs for just encompassing this whole system. Okay, what is the air defense identification zone? This is a, there's been a continuous aid is in effect on the, around the continental US Canada since back in the 40s, 50s. This is uh, a military um, defense identification zone where we want to be, we want to know of all aircraft or otherwise air breathing vehicles that are coming in to the US, anything off the surface of the water. It is a varying zone. The inner ADAS actually goes out to the territorial limits, about a 12-mile limit. And we have an outer ADAS where that varies depending on it goes out into international waters, varies the distance off the coastline 
uh, depending on the actual location. This is a graphic representation here showing you um, the distance of those points to the closest points off the Florida coast and the requirements that you have to report yourself to the ADAs uh, or prior to entering the ADAs to fulfill the requirements of the coded flight reg 99 um, that we'll talk about the specifics of that here in a moment. Um, when you follow those regulations, it's basically a, a non, uh, it's a non-issue because th with the overlapping air traffic control systems and the radars, and if you're following the procedures correctly, you're identified, and it's, this happens hundreds, thousands of times a day. It's only the uh, few people that are not following the rules that become what we're concerned about. So how can you help? Well, as general aviation, the pilot compliance with CFR 99, it's not a, a suggested reg. It's a, a regulation that you have to follow when you're going to fly these, um, if you're going to fly out in through the ADAs. Uh, there's multiple things in that regulation. It's very easy to access on the web and, or at your local FBO if you're going to go in and out of uh, the continental US. You have to file and activate your flight plan. You have to have an operational transponder. Uh, you have to have a functioning two-way radio and provide your position reports. This is the one that probably gets violated the most. People will go out and they'll have the required equipment on board, but for one reason or another, you're, they're lazy about um, actually doing the procedure to come back in the ADAs. So this following the position report is you have to be talking to one of those centers, Miami Center or Jacksonville Center, talking specifically about the Bahamian Corridor, prior to penetrating that ADAs line. If there's no appropriate reporting point, or if you're taken off at a field that's inside, like Bimini, that's inside that ADAs already, then they have procedures for that too, where you report immediately after takeoff if you can't do it 15 minutes out. Um, ADAs violations be prepared. Let's say we're going to go, for instance, all the way down to the worst case scenario. Um, Oak Grove is a uh, military um, radio station that will broadcast on UHF and VHF guard, VHF guard mostly for general aviation pilots. What you can expect from them is an unknown rider call. Anybody that's flown in Florida, you probably have heard unknown rider calls and you might wonder, what, what is that guy talking about? Well, they'll talk, uh, unknown rider, unknown rider, they'll give a persistent reference off a of nav aid and then tell you whatever amplifying information where they're identifying a specific target of interest or an aircraft that it's not following the procedures for whatever reason. They're not squawking, they're not talking to anybody yet. Um, obviously, you have to know if that's you or not, or the system is of no use. So if they say unknown rider, 20 miles northeast of Fort Pierce, Florida, um, traveling 120 knots, headed, you know, bearing 330, if you're flying off, you know, the coast of Sarasota and you hear that call, they're not talking to you. What are you gonna do if you think it possibly is you? Answer the call. If you're talking on, an air traffic control facility, and they're not talking to you, then it might be just as simple as making sure that you're not them. You can turn and broadcast on 121.5. If you're uh, doing that, they have the ground-based repeater stations where they can hear that and make sure that it's not you. If you identify yourself, if you're in that area and you're not sure if it's you or not, the best thing to do is just talk to them. They'll come right back and go, you know, with your call sign and say, nope, it's not you, we're talking to somebody else, and then you're in the clear again. Um, to identify whether it's you or not, they're going to ask you the following questions, your point of origin, where you're going, identify who you are. And then that's it. You, you've done the right procedures and now you're identified and you come on in. Um, okay, moving from air defense identification zone to temporary flight restrictions. This is, I'm a general aviation pilot. These things pop up, they come down. Some of them are fixed, like the one over Disney World. Um, this one over Gainesville Regional was up there last weekend for the Gainesville Air Show, just north of here. Um, temporary flight restrictions are what I think of as a necessary evil. People don't like them because what are they doing? They're restricting where you can fly. If you're used to flying back and forth from Jacksonville to go down to Cedar Key and have lunch, and you normally fly right over Gainesville, that's fine 364 days a year. But the day they have that TFR, if you don't uh, check the NOTAMs and know that it's there, then you could be in violation of that FAA airspace and could be getting phone calls about it. So. Uh, the period 05 to 06, 63 TFR violations. What were they for? There's generally a TFR popped up over the president whenever he travels outside the National Command region. Um, and, he, and, you know, he might be going somewhere short notice that wasn't planned. For instance, today he's in uh, Virginia, Virginia Tech, because of the massacre they had there yesterday. That TFR was obviously a very short notice. 
Um, I don't know that for a fact, but there is probably a TFR over Blacksburg, Virginia today because he was going to go there and, and give a speech at the ceremony. Um, he might be going out on the uh, road for a campaign a lot next year in support. Sometimes he travels more. Sometimes he doesn't travel as often, so it's just uh, something to be heads up on if you're going to fly out there. Anything others that are concerned, uh, national special security events or NSSEs, when those are identified by the Secretary of Defense um, in conjunction with the FAA, like a space shuttle launch, the Super Bowl, you know, large events like that, maybe a NASCAR race, anywhere where they think uh, there's either a potential for a threat or they actually have notice of a threat, they could, pop, they could throw up a TFR over that area and you would need to be aware of that. Uh, what can you do to avoid them? It's as simple as a call to 1-800 weather brief or getting on any of the um, commercially available sites out there like this aeroplanner.com site, which is going to graphically show the TFRs and it's very easy to show it. Um, I know, especially in Florida, Arizona, we have a lot of uh, general aviation pilots. The weather is beautiful. We like to get out there, not follow a flight plan, and just you know drive to drive up to Ocala for lunch, or we're going to go over to. Cocoa Beach and fly up and down the beach once and come home. I don't really need to file a flight plan. Again, that may work most every days, but even if you don't want to file a flight plan, it's pretty much irresponsible if you're not at least going to make that call and make sure that the TFRs are out there and check the notams of where you're going to and from. So you've got, it's very easy to do. There's numerous websites or a phone, simple phone call can have that done. Contact the ATC, ATC facility uh, once you're in the air and query them on any TFRs that are up there. If you, get, if you request a full brief from flight service, they're always going to include any appropriate notams and TFRs for your route of flight. Okay, air defense scrambles and, uh, and diverts for why are we actually going to, why would the military actually, with this integrated layer defense that I've been talking about, actually scramble a fighter? Well, there's multiple reasons. Um, ADA's violations and TFRs, the two things we just talked about, a threat to a high value asset if you had a suspicious aircraft. Um, a September 11th scenario that's not doing, following the procedures, it's flight plan like it's supposed to, or just stops talking to air traffic control, where you have a potential hijacking, the FAA thinks there might be a hijacking. The, again, the command and control between the FAA and the military is much improved since September 11th. If they request that kind of information or that kind of assistance from DOD, that's when we would scramble um, some fighter aircraft. Again, NORTHCOM, NORADs. A primary mission is air sovereignty, so that's why we would do it. What is going to happen if this happened? The fighter procedures, without going into the op actual operational specifics of what they're going to do, um, the fighters are trained and they practice these scenarios constantly with practice scramble alerts and exercising the air spaces um, to, to run their procedures. They are going to have contact by radar by three nautical miles or stay a thousand feet off the altitude of what air traffic control knows that they're at. They will not get any closer than one mile without having an actual radar lock or a thousand feet. And then, if needed, they might just stay off that far. The person in that general aviation aircraft may not even know they're ever there. If they can identify them or otherwise the pilot starts all of a sudden starts communicating and at any point in this obviously the alert fighter could be told to knock off the engagement, go home and it would be referred back to the FAA or law enforcement for whatever action would need to be taken. They're going to go no closer than required for mission accomplishment. Um, the Payne Stewart type of scenario where they had um, a decompression of the cockpit and everybody was knocked out in the cockpit and you just have a Learjet flying across the continental US not talking to anybody. That's an episode where if that kind of scenario happens now, we may scramble fires. The fighters may get clearance all the way in to go up to the cockpit and actually visually see is the pilot there. Is there a pilot in the cockpit? Is the pilot slumped over the controls? Because you're trying to determine exactly what's going on in that aircraft. Uh, the fighters will actually be talking to air traffic control, obviously, during the whole time deconflicting. And how close they get kind of depends on exactly uh, the threat, where it's headed, you know, what they think the uh, scenario is. Again, how can you help? OK, is this me again? If a fighter comes flying by you, this is what I think of as the big oops. If that's happened, then something bad has happened. You've either. Uh, flown through a TFR, you've flown too close, or you've not identified yourself through an ADA, any of these multiples of things, um, you can expect the following questions. The fighter itself may be trying to contact you on VHF guard. Some of the fighters have capability to, to broadcast on VHF, some of them don't. Um, 
They're going to be asking the same type of things that aircraft traffic control or the Oak Grove would be asking you over the guard position to try to identify who you are, where you're going, uh, where you're filed, and if you're going to be followed by the aircraft itself. If the fighter actually intercepts you, uh, like I said, they may try to contact you on 121.5. That's the time where if you haven't been talking on the radios, now it's time to do it um, and get control of the air, air traffic control facility immediately. Um, that engagement of the fighter in your aircraft is going to be broken off if you start, if you notify the intentions and they have contact with you now. Um, otherwise, you want to watch for the appropriate ICAO visual signals of what to do with an intercepting, intercepted aircraft, which is in the ICAO procedures rules of the air, and I'm going to go over it here in a minute. And uh, of course, immediate compliance with that fighter aircraft instruction is mandatory via the um, federal regulations. What can you expect? Uh, pretty much the response, if you look through this grid, I'm not going to go step by step through it, but rocking your aircraft wings basically means that you understand that uh, you have been intercepted and you're going to comply with the instructions. By a simple wing rock to the fighter aircraft, you're telling them that you, you understand and will comply. That's the meaning for your intercepted aircraft. Uh, the actual intercepting aircraft, what's he going to do? He may come up beside you, be flashing his lightings, and uh, a slow turn. If he does a slow turn, that means follow me. So follow him, rock your wings, follow them. Um, if he does an abrupt breakaway, it means he's coming off and you can proceed. That means you, you're talking to your traffic control or he's breaking off the engagement. If he actually is in front of you, lowers the landing gear, and overflies a suitable runway, then the intention is that you're, you need to land there. And you can do that by the same thing. If you're not a fixed gear aircraft, lower your landing gear and, and comply with those instructions. Uh, same type of thing on this, on this, just the backwards, how you, can, uh, sh how you can tell the intercepting aircraft exactly what you plan on doing. If, you, uh, if he's trying to make you land somewhere that's not suitable for your type of aircraft by raising the gear, you're saying you can't fly there, he's going to um, take you somewhere else. If you uh, just flash your lights, you're telling him that you can't comply. If you're not rocking the aircraft, he'll rock back and say, understand it. And uh, irregular flashing means you're in distress. You're going where you're going to go, and you know, the scenario will go from there. OK, getting off the, uh, the bad problems, because you know, if one of those things happens to you, you get intercepted by a fire, it's probably not your day. Um, it's going to be go back to the the FAA or law enforcement for appropriate action once you get on the ground. Let's talk about what AFNORTH or CONER can do um, for the Air Operations Center directly in support of the civil, civil support for some type of disaster type of relief. Um, general guidelines, what does the military do? The military, you know, before Katrina was kind of like September 11th. When you're talking about disaster relief, we are only uh, kind of a passive observer into a scenario. We would only, we have assets for search and rescue. The Civil Air Patrol is kind of a branch wing, you know, not directly under control of the DOD unless they're doing a DOD type mission. Um, and they would not be specifically planning on working in a mission. Since Katrina and since uh, we saw the, um, how a federal response can greatly improve or, or injure a situation depending on how you want to look at it. Um, our guidelines have changed a little bit now, and our Air Ops Center at Tyndall Air Force Base specifically is going to be in a much more active mode as far as planning of how we can help civilian agencies respond to some type of disaster scenario. Um, FEMA or the state's going to determine through the FAA if any temporary flight restrictions are actually going to go into effect over a, a specific area. They'll request that to the FAA. The FAA is going to always control that airspace internally. Um, it's kind of a misconception amongst a lot in the general community and general aviation that the military is going to come in and seize control of the airspace. We, don't, we do not do that. That's, the airspace is always going to be under the FAA's purvey, and, and they're the ones that are going to control that. Um, what kind of capabilities can we do? If it's an enormously bad scenario like Katrina where all your ground-based radars and communication systems are out, we have airborne uh, AWACS, which is an airborne warning control system, they can actually come in and from the air take over and control airspace as far as making the communications, run the air traffic control radar from an airborne platform. So we have that capability. We have the Combined Forces Air Component Commander, who is the commander of AFNORTH, that General Morrow, that is going to 
be the airspace control authority, but he's only the airspace control authority for the actual DOD assets. Again, the FAA runs the airspace. The civilian aviation is never controlled by the military. Um, even the what we call the Title 32 assets, or the Florida Air Guard, the uh, Mississippi Air Guard, the South Colombian Air Guard, those entities are all controlled and under the um, command and control structure of the governor of those states. The Title 32 assets are encouraged to participate, but if that governor doesn't specifically request that DOD come in and take control of it, that's going to remain under the control of that, of that governor. Uh, the Title 10, the federal assets, will always be the um, help of last resort, kind of think of it. It will be the last ones to come in. And of course, the FAA is always going to be the control authority in the NOTAMs for the airspace. Uh, this is an example of our web page that's out in the, uh, on the internet to open domain that will be able to be accessible by um, anybody in the general aviation community that's, that's flying in. It's under uh, www.afnorth.us. And what you can expect to find there that's going to be of some use is under the air domain execution documents, the main, the top four, the top three up there are the ones that are going to be of give some useful information if you're going to be flying in and around uh, a disaster relief type area. The airspace control orders, airspace control plan, and what we call the contingency response air support schedule, or the CRAS, will be posted here. We'll show you what the uh, military um, assets, the DOD assets that will be flying in the area, what their schedule is, so you can kind of de-conflict with that. The contingency response air support schedule, like I just mentioned, this is, we will post this from the combat plans division only as good as the information that we're getting back from the units. What it basically is, is what would be under the military operations an air tasking order. It's not an actual tasking order for a contingency operation like that because we don't necessarily control these assets. We don't control these assets. This is, we're going to put on there any aircraft that want to come in and, and tell us what they're doing in this disaster relief area so that everybody can get an overall picture of what's flying in that area. We don't actually take control of our tactical control or optical control or operational control of the, of the assets. They are just, uh, this air support schedule is really out there so that everybody can show, everybody can see what other organizations are flying. The airspace control order, uh, depending on what type of software you have access to, uh, Falcon View Maps or the text, the airspace control order that we'll post up on that web page it's going to show both in graphic depiction and in just the, the verbal, the word depiction, exactly what's going on with, that, with the supposed airspace. Uh, temporary flight restrictions that, again, are imposed by the FAA, those will be shown on there, as well as specific tracks for the air refueling aircraft, the search and rescue aircraft, or anything else that's flying in the local area. Here's an example of what it might look like. I know it's, uh, it would take a long time to plot all that. Um, from a verbal method, if you have one of the graphical programs, it makes it a lot easier. Uh, the airspace control plan. This is in conjunction with that control orders. This is going to show exactly what type of overlaid airspace is in, the, in that joint operations area. Um, the joint operations area that is, that is layered down over a specific area, we will have entry exit procedures to deconflict all like type aircraft, Title 10 aircraft that might be going in and out of an area. Take uh, Hurricane Wilma that attacked, that attacked, I like to say attacked, on Florida from the hurricanes. Um, when it struck South Florida, the uh, military overlaid a, a grid overlay, and we came up with procedures for the multiple numbers of state relief aircraft, the National Guard helicopters that were flying in and out, to deconflict them so that you know we don't want to compound tragedy on tragedy by having a midair up there. This is just some of the... Uh, an example of the kind of planning that the DOD will do for a joint operations area. Spider points, these are all control points that we dis um, discussing in this joint ops area where the uh, search and rescue responding aircraft would fly between. We overlay a grid on it so that we know, let's say, uh, you know, rescue aircraft from um, Patrick Air Force Base over in Cape Canaveral, they're going to be operating in Sector 174, we grid out like this. This way, everybody that has access to the airspace control plan, which again is public domain, would be able to tell where those assets were operating. Uh, we'll deconflict uh, 
altitudes and airspeeds for the different type of aircraft. Um, the real thing to remember is it's VFR flight rules out there, and the Airspace Control Authority is always going to stay the FAA. There's nothing, the military doesn't even want to restrict the airspace over disaster relief area, anything that's beyond that, which is what required for the immediate response and the safety and security of that area. It's really the domain of the FAA to determine we need to get commerce going back in here, we need to get the relief flights going in, general aviation aircraft are going to want to get back in and check on their own specific property or start getting stuff flying around, around there again. They're the ones that are going to control the temporary flight restrictions and get the uh, general aviation aircraft moving back and forth in that joint ops area. All right, just uh, reviewing what we went over today. Talk a little bit about the NORAD mission. I'm going to take some question and answers. Uh, anything you want to talk about after this. Talked about our uh, ADA's operations, how critical it is to uh, specifically follow those procedures in the CFR 99. Uh, temporary flight restrictions, that's probably the biggest gotcha for a general aviation aircraft to uh, know those procedures and do them right so that you don't get the fighter intercept coming up on you. If it does, what are the intercept procedures and what you should do for general aviation. Uh, thanks for following the procedures. That's really the main point we want to get across what we do up there um, in the uh, Combat Plans Division in the Air Ops Center is try to uh, accentuate the proper procedures that general, air, general aviation aircraft can follow so that the air sovereignty of the U.S. is maintained, which is the number one mission. Uh, lastly, I want to brief or leave you with the AFNORTH webpage again, that www.afnorth.us. That's where you can find the information whenever we have an actual disaster response operation that we have going on. And that's it. Any, any questions? Anyone? Major General Morrow. Anybody want to know that one again? He's my commander. He's going to get on me when he hears my formal letter. Uh, the corridor that you were talking about in the ATIS, uh, the 12 mile corridor, mm -hmm. and then sometimes it could be an overlap a little bit. Right. How do you know? I mean, can you distinguish that a little bit, the difference? Yes, the, the outer ADAs is something that the, mili the, um, the air traffic control system of the U.S. is designed to try to identify uh, the aircraft in this outer, outer area of the ADAs. There's no, that's over international waters, and we don't control. The FAA and the air traffic control system of the U.S. does not control aircraft that are outside, that are in the outer ADAs. That is a, really more for our use in determining, hey, how far out do we really want to look at who's flying and try to get an ID on them? We're going to try to see them and ID them before they actually get to that line so that we're already calling them by the time you hit that 12-mile line. Because with the type and speed of the aircraft, really, if they have hostile intent or they are, you know, have no intention of following the procedure, they're not just somebody that's messed up their flight planning, um, that 12 miles is really not that far, given the, uh, the, the altitude and speed. So if you have a um, you know, a Learjet or something that has hostile intent that's flying at a high rate of speed, we're going to be trying to identify that in our outer ADAs region, even though we're not actually controlling it, or the air sovereignty only extends out for the actual inner ADAs, or the 12 miles. Does that answer? Okay. Anyone else? We have a microphone in the back. If anybody wants it, we can share it around. Hi, thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. And Ty's here to answer questions after the show is over as well. Okay. Thank you. Okay.